So as Ray just said, I'm Lisa Burke Hugh. I'm in the Office of uh, Generic Drug Policy. For those who know me, I will never, ever um, prevent anyone from going to lunch quickly. So I'm going to try to get through this quickly so everyone can eat um, and stop those rumbling stomachs. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about two documents. The first is the Good ANDA Submission Practices Draft Guidance for Industry. And then the second is the Good ANDA Assessment Practices Manual of Policies and Procedures also known as a map. So as, back, wow, as background, um, the Drug Competition Action Plan was announced in 2017. This is a multi-step plan to increase market competition and facilitate entry of low-cost alternatives into the market. Um, one component of DCAP is to streamline ANDA submission and ANDA review. Uh, to achieve this goal, we released these two talk documents that I'm going to talk about today. So the guidance in the map, they contain different information and they are in, uh, they're targeted towards different audiences, but we think that both of them serve as process improvements that are going to build upon the success of the GDUFA program that Cook and Ted talked about earlier today. Uh, so the guidance is geared towards applicants to help you avoid common deficiencies that uh, can lead to a delay in, um, in ANDA review uh, or ANDA approval. The map, in contrast, is targeted towards OGD and OPQ, and it improves the efficiency and effectiveness of, um, of our assessment. So the good ANDA submission practices guidance it describes common recurring deficiencies that can delete, lead to a delay in ANDA approval. These are the things that we see over and over again that result in deficiencies. Uh, the guidance is limited to deficiencies that we see in substantive review. It doesn't go into deficiencies that we see in filing review. Those deficiencies are uh, detailed in other guidances that you can take a look at um, off our website. So for each of these common recurring deficiencies, we list about 40 or so of them. We make recommendations on how to um, address those deficiencies, how to avoid those deficiencies. And then we also cite to regulations and guidances, so there's other places you can look for additional information. So this is the general landscape of the deficiencies that we go into, uh, patents and exclusivities, labeling, a broad swath of deficiencies related to product quality, and then bioequivalence deficiencies. So this is, you know, 40 or so deficiencies, the most common ones. It is not all of the deficiencies that our reviewers see during um, ANDA assessment. And as Cook really emphasized this morning, it is an applicant's responsibility to submit that high quality, complete ANDA that we can approve in that first review cycle. So for next steps, this was posted in the Federal Register in January of this year. Um, I included the docket number, so if you want to take a look at the guidance, which I encourage you to do. Um, and also the comments associated with it, you can. The 60-day comment period closed in March, and we are currently reviewing comments on that guidance. So as I mentioned before, the good ANDA assessment practices map, um, this is geared towards OGD and OPQ to make our assessment practices more efficient and effective. And it does so by doing three primary things. First, it says that assessors should use templates and assessment tools to focus on the critical attributes of the application. So this means that it allows assessors to really focus on whether that specific ANDA meets the regulatory requirements for approval. Um, it further uh, makes our internal process more efficient by clarifying the roles and responsibilities of primary assessors, secondary assessors, and division directors to reduce any duplicative to reduce any duplicative work and any unnecessary work. And then finally, it makes um, it this all more effective in terms of our communications by really emphasizing that OGD and OPQ will clearly communicate what deficiencies must be corrected for an ANDA to be approved. We hope that making these three changes will lead to higher quality resubmissions, so when you're responding back to these deficiencies, and will also reduce the number of subsequent review cycles. Um, if you go to FDA's map, I included the map number here. You can plug that in and then take a look at that map that's available publicly. 
So in summary, I really encourage you to review the good ANDA submission practices draft guidance. This goes into those common deficiencies that we see over and over again. And if you take a look at this, um, it'll also make recommendations to you on how you can avoid those deficiencies so you can get your application approved faster. Um, we also, in addition to focusing on what applicants can do, are taking steps to approve the efficiency of our internal assessment process of ANDAs. And both of these actions are really, I think, important process improvements um, that will achieve that drug competition action plan goal of, review, of reducing the review, number of review cycles to approval. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. So clearly today we've given you a lot of reading. It almost feels like you're back in college with all the, uh, the literature you have to circle back to. But please know there's a lot of really good information in those, and we really strongly encourage you to take a look at all that information and refer to the FDA website for those shortcuts. So today we've mentioned a little bit about the good abbreviated new drug application assessment practices, the map itself, which describes a little bit about our thinking of the assessment process. So to that end, we're going to go a little bit more into some of the software tools that we're exploring that will help support our assessors as they evaluate these and the submissions. Again, my name is Sarah Kurtz. I am currently serving as an advisor in the Office of Regulatory Operations in the Office of Generic Drugs. My background is in labeling, so I do have that spin on, on kind of the assessment piece and the guidance. So there's essentially two things, two general concepts I'd like you to take away from today. Um, from this portion of the presentations. Very high level is an understanding of what we're doing to incorporate software into our assessment practices, and the second being what this means to you and the public. So as we're developing tools to help our assessors and the teams, we're looking at a number of different things. So we're looking at what sources of information or databases are being used by our assessors. So one example being the Orange Book, another the Inactive Ingredient Database. We're looking at what types of information and how it's being submitted by applicants. So different Word documents, data that's being supplied, trial data. We're looking at PDF files, all those types of sources of information. We're also looking at what type of knowledge has been gained from the agency's experience with the same or similar drug products. So looking at therapeutic classes and different dosage forms. We're also looking at what relevant or related policy documents are used during the assessment process. So while you're also looking at the guidance documents, we're internally evaluating those and looking at those and trying to integrate those into our assessment piece as well. And we're also looking to see are there discipline-specific types of information or cross-discipline connections that can be made which will help limit some of the duplicative efforts or duplicative reviews. And then finally, how does the assessor use information from these various sources? Are we using it to validate? Are we using it as general information or background that helps provide a little bit more of that story? Are we looking at it as critical information that will support our decision? So when we're considering how to continue streamlining our assessment practices, we're targeting how the technology can help assessors maximize their focus on rigorous scientific and regulatory assessments while minimizing some of the more administrative tasks or exercises. So looking, having to go search for data, having to go look for information, some of the copying and pasting to support and, and provide that into our templates. Some of the areas we've identified include the ability to automatically populate information to the discipline templates. So this will help present information to the assessor in a more efficient format. We're looking at labeling and quality in our bioequivalence pieces to see what types of connections we can make across those. We're looking to extract and apply information from each of those submissions. Some of that standard information, for example, for 356H forms. What can we pull from that and present to the reviewer, present to the individual that's doing that assessment? We're looking to integrate information from multiple sources. So as we've mentioned, the reviewers or the assessors evaluate or use a number of different resources to complete their assessment. So how are we going to, ideally, some of this information could be extracted from these different databases and integrated and presented to the assessor through a user interface to make it more efficient. And another opportunity is through establishing connections across related products. So recognizing knowledge that we find and related to one drug product may be helpful as we evaluate a similar or a related drug product. So our goal is to improve knowledge management capabilities through some of these connections. So essentially, how will this affect the public and industry? We do anticipate greater use of software in the assessments, and this will lead to greater consistency in the assessment of submissions. 
It will facilitate connections across assessments and improve knowledge management. We anticipate improvements in the timeliness during the assessment. The assessors will spend less time searching for information or populating discipline templates and can focus primarily on the assessment of the application, which then lends itself to this final bullet of being able to prioritize our assessor time. So the assessor can then be more focused on that rigorous scientific and regulatory assessment rather than some of the more administrative exercising and finding information. So this does support our efforts to prioritize the time that's spent on each application, um, which also supports our goals of taking approval actions more quickly on ANDAs that, act, that qualify or that meet the criteria for approval. We're looking to increase our first cycle approvals and also continue meeting or exceeding our Good Do For Two commitments, so as you've heard today. So to summarize, how are we incorporating software into our assessment practices? What we're looking at is a means of assembling and presenting information to the assessor that will help maximize their focus on that rigorous scientific and regulatory assessment. And how will these tools benefit the public and industry? By prioritizing our assessor time and resources. We're looking to reduce the amount of time used on more administrative pieces and be able to focus more on that actual assessment piece. So as Lisa mentioned, Please take a look at the, the Good ANDA Submission Practices Draft Guidance. Please also know we are taking steps to enhance efficiency in ANDA assessments through process and software improvements. And these are both intended to help with our efforts to increase first cycle approvals and also reduce time to approval actions when the criteria are met. And with that, I thank you very much for your time and attention and wish you a very enjoyable lunch. And Jeff will give you a little bit more background on that.